Welcome to week two. This week we're actually going to start getting into some specific areas of authority and we're looking specifically at what the two primary agencies for food safety can do in terms of their enforcement abilities. How can they come into facilities and inspect and take actions when they find areas of deviation. Uh, we won't get into the definitions until next week, but areas like adulteration, misbranding, where they find that the product is potentially of a risk to the public, that they can then use that authority while being in the facility to take actions, and we'll, we'll see a wide scope of what that can be, from uh, recalling product to suspending uh, operations, there's a whole lot of power that these agencies can and utilize. And in part, we see that that power is what brings some scrutiny and some very deep attention for facilities. They really want to make sure that they avoid these type of issues, that these uh, enforcement powers are used appropriately, and that the actions they're taking are in compliance with the statute. So today, we're going to focus first on the USDA and then we'll go into the FDA. And unlike last week, it won't matter if you start with the FDA lecture and then move into the uh, USDA lecture. Those two will be pretty interchangeable. And then the third 20-minute component that we'll have, we'll look at some case law and some restrictions, some challenges that we've had to both the USDA's inspection authority as well as to the uh, FDA's inspection authority. And we'll get into some more topics there. But today we're talking about the Food Safety Inspection Service, and for ease of purpose, we'll just refer to this as the USDA inspection arm. And what we're talking about, we always start, as you recall, with understanding what the regulatory authority is for this agency. What basis do they have to take these actions? And from last week's lecture, we saw there's a wide gamut of sources of law that we can look at everything from the Constitution down to the Code of Federal Regulations, those administrative rules. There's a lot of ways for agencies to act, and so it's important from the beginning to see what those authorities are going to be. So when we're talking about the USDA, the principal statutes that are going to be involved are the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Poultry Products Inspection Act. That's going to give them to the authority to inspect and to set criteria for beef, pork, and poultry products. For any meat product, uh, that is not seafood or fish, freshwater fish, uh, you know, reindeer, there's a whole wide gamut of game meats and different um, uh, meat that fall in this category. That's a secondary statute, that's the Agricultural Marketing Act. Again, makes sense that it's within the USDA, and we'll talk about what the inspection authority is under that act. Now, we really focused on our prior lecture about Title 21. A little bit of Title VII as being the primary sources of food law uh, when we look at the Code of Federal Regulations. Here we will see a new title, Title IX. It is the primary uh, source of rules when we look at some of the enforcement powers for uh, the USDA's inspection arm. And Title IX is reserved for agricultural uh, animal products and animal livestock uh, areas. So if you see Title IX, uh, pretty much think of this authority for the USDA to act and take these actions we'll discuss. So one of the very first things that we looked at at the overview of the USDA and FDA in terms of inspection was the difference in how the FDA inspected randomly and how the USDA operates on this continuous inspection model. The USDA has a much narrower focus. You know, looking at the primary statutes, we're looking at beef, pork, and poultry products compared to the FDA, which has everything else. So in some ways, this enables the USDA to have inspectors continuously on site looking at every production run that is occurring. And I think that that's not the only reason that happens, but there, that is definitely an ability, uh, or one of the reasons it gives them that ability to stay in facilities. But, but one way to think of this is that a facility absolutely cannot run USDA slaughtering or processing without having a USDA inspector in the facility. And that, that is one difference that you will see and it makes it very unique. And we can talk about uh, how this plays out in policy as well, looking at the uh, slaughter and processing of horse meat. For a long time that was allowed, but then restrictions were put in place where there were no longer inspectors to be in those type of facilities. 
who's not inspectors to be in those type of facilities, then under the statute at the time, that meant that it was effectively shut down. And if you look in the news, the USDA is regaining that authority for meat production of horse meat. So something interesting that by removing the inspectors from the facility, you effectively shut it down, that industry. One of the things that we'll get into is mandatory versus voluntary. You can kind of guess from if it's a continuous inspection, it's a mandatory inspection. Uh, what you'll see, and you probably have seen it if you've purchased any meat products in the U.S., there's that USDA stamp. You probably have seen it too on carcasses. When they go through and they're looking at the carcass, there's a vegetable dye stamp that goes on to say that's USDA approved and it can continue for processing. That's a mandatory inspection. It has to occur. It has to get that stamp before it can move on for additional production. And we see that for anything that falls under the FMI or the PPI. So poultry products, beef products, pork products. Anything that is outside of those products is voluntary. So game meats and some other areas that we'll see, those are voluntary. And, and we can have that inspection come in. We cannot have that inspection come in. It depends on what the facility wants. But if you are falling under the FMI or the PPI, there's no question. You have to have an inspector, continuous inspection in a facility, and that inspection is mandatory. Next, we have to kind of look at what are the types of facilities that we will, we will look at. And there's basically two types of facilities. There's the slaughtering plants and the processing plants. And this can be a very difficult area to talk about. It's not an area that you want photos. So this slide presentation, don't worry, doesn't have any photos from inside of these facilities. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it is a difficult topic as we get into what can lead to some of these issues. But um, it, it is the nature of the industry. And, and if you've worked in this area, you probably become a little bit uh, desensitized to that. But in the slaughtering plants, the main things that the USDA is looking for is the animal diseases. Uh, probably the best known is, are we seeing symptoms of mad cow uh, or something to that effect? And they're looking at the, inspecting the carcass before and after slaughter. And they're also, to uh, some extent, making sure, as we'll get into, that the slaughter of the animal is humane. And that is something that the USDA enforces. And then once we, the animal is slaughtered and the carcass has gone on for processing, that's the processing plant. And the, F, and the USDA is looking at sanitation, monitoring compliance, making sure that the, the, there isn't any process that's going to introduce a contaminant at that point. We know that by the time it gets to the processing plant, it's been inspected, and so it shouldn't have any issues, and then we don't want to introduce any contaminants at that point. And the USDA also works with state inspection programs, and so that is uh, an area that we will see uh, because one of the things that we have to remember is that the only authority for the USDA to act is under the Federal Meat Inspection Act. The only authority for the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Poultry Products Act to be in effect is if there's interstate commerce. So if you're raising cattle in Nebraska and you're slaughtering them in Nebraska and then they're going to be shipped out to New York for sale, that's interstate commerce. And now you've in invoked a federal statute. But if you're raising cattle in Nebraska and you're slaughtering cattle in Nebraska, processing it there, and then you're just selling it within the state, you haven't yet fallen under federal commerce. And so what we see is that we'll get into in the third presentation is some of the restrictions that the courts have put in place. And one of the restrictions is if that product isn't entering the stream of commerce, isn't going across the states, then it's the authority of the states to inspect and to make sure that everything is in compliance. And the USDA does partner with these programs to help uh, offer inspectors and training. And so we, we won't talk about that too much, but it is an area to, to think about, that if the, if the meat is staying within the state and all of the processing and slaughtering steps are within the state, then the, the USDA will partner, but it will largely be state law. So now we get down to the really interesting parts, and I put in each of the uh, code sections here, so you can go ahead and, and find those, and if you have any trouble, feel free to email me. I can give you a link to the Code of Federal Regulations. You can kind of get a sense of what this code section looks like. But we're going to get into now the major enforcement powers that the USDA's inspection arm can use. 
and there's going to be about three or four that they use and we start from what I guess you could say is a low low threshold of action where it's it's getting the facility's attention but it's not shutting down the facility and will escalate as those issues get worse or as that um, issue is left unresolved. So the first thing that the USDA can do is called regulatory control action and we see this in Title IX of the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 500. And Section 500 is going to have all of our uh, enforcement powers that we'll talk about. And then point one, that's going to tell us the, what part, this is the first rule, the first um, subject addressed in Section 500, and it's subpart A. So that's a, a way to read the statute. And we see that there are three uh, regulatory control actions that the USDA can take. They can retain product, they can reject equipment or facilities that are coming online, they can slow or stop pr production lines if it looks like product is being skipped or inspection isn't occurring for every carcass or every uh, meat product coming through, they can have it slow down, they can stop it, reinspect. Those are the basic principles for this regulatory control actions. So that's what they can do. And when they can do it, there are uh, four listed out here, the, what I call the triggers for regulatory control action. So basically, if the, if the USDA sees any of these actions, including the in, inhumane handling or slaughtering of livestock, which is um, you know, good to see, it's not just about the risk of uh, adulteration, which is you know, micro-contamination, uh, physical contamination with products like dirt, glass, those sort of things, uh, or misbranding, you know, calling um, a turkey product a pork product or, you know, or not saying, you know, we can get into next week, uh, I think next week is adulteration and misbranding. We'll get into some more definitions of how exactly that can happen. But basically, it's nice to see that it's not just focused on the risk to the, the public, but it is to some extent focused on the, the well-being of the livestock. So those are the reasons that the regulatory control actions can occur. And th these are uh, exercised pretty frequently. And we can look at the 2013 numbers for that. And, we, and, and it's a quarterly report that the USDA puts out. And they also put out an annual report to look at the numbers. And if that's of interest to you, I can email that to you. The next enforcement power that the USDA has, and, and as I mentioned, each carcass has to have a stamp that it was inspected, and the meat products you always see have USDA inspected on there, and that's called the mark. That's the um, the stamp or mark that that the product has been inspected and it passed the inspection. And so one of the enforcement powers that the USDA can uh, yield is uh, withholding the mark. They can refuse to allow the marks of inspection to be applied, which basically means that product cannot be sold. And so now we've just escalated the issues. We've gone from retaining the product and making sure that it's reinspected or that the issue that is there is fixed to actually not allowing that product into the stream of commerce. We're not allowing it to be sold or consumed until there's some issues that are resolved. And it, and it may be that that product has to be destroyed. It may not be able to be reconditioned. So this is typically reserved for more serious or systematic problems. And you can see, it, here's the code section, again, Title IX, Code of Federal Regulations. And this one through seven, there are seven reasons that the USDA's inspection arm can withhold its mark. And I encourage you to go and visit and look at all seven. I put up some of the big ones here. Um, we mentioned the hazard analysis and critical control point last week, the HACCP plan. So basically what that is saying is if if they are not identifying and controlling the risks of contamination in their facility, then it needs to stop. We need to go back and we need to look at what is wrong and what are we overlooking uh, you know, in terms of sanitation, in terms of risks, um, contamination, the whole gamut. S uh, sanitary conditions that render the entire facility adulterated. You see this with uh, pest control problems and, and it can get really gross of finding um, mice, cockroaches, um, even just the carcass of any of those rodents or um, insects, uh, mil mildew, mold, uh, collection of water where uh, micro uh, contaminations can uh, really flourish. 
Uh, we see, you know, a, a lot of really gross things in facilities sometimes that just get old or uh, just fall into disrepair. And so the entire facility is basically deemed uh, unsanitary because anything that will be processed in there has a high risk of being contaminated with something. And so that's, that's one of the grounds that the USDA will uphold its mark. And an interesting one I wanted to put on here, you have to kind of think about the high stakes of what is happening in this facility. You have USDA official, an inspector, typically several of them in the facility, either stopping production lines, saying product has to be destroyed, really exercising some strong powers. And you could see where this could be some loss of dollars to the facility, and that could lead to some threats, to some assault, to some really tense moments. And so there is a provision in here that if there is a, a, an assault or threat of an assault on any of the officials from the USDA and by members of the facility, that is a basis for withholding the mark. So again, with the humane slaughter and with the assault or threat to the USDA officials, we see that the policy isn't always focused on safety of the product. It is focused sometimes on other policy issues humane treatment of animals, humane slaughter, and ensuring that the uh, USDA inspection is occurring in an amicable way and that any action to influence them uh, is not tolerated. So, you know, we go beyond the, the issues of simply identifying risks of adulteration or misbranding. So this is an escalation. We saw with the last one, you know, we just are taking time to correct the the issue and you, know, you can slow the production line and you can quickly get back to, to normal production. Here we've escalated the issue up where we're, you know, there's not going to be an ability to quickly hose down the facility and say, yeah, we're ready to go. These issues are getting more complex and more difficult to uh, correct. What I typically say is with the regulatory control actions, those can be resolved within the plant, quality managers, plant and floor managers working to resolve that issue and get the production going. I'd say by the time you get to a withholding, it's about the time that council would come in, work to, to be sort of a mediator between the agency and the facility, and to uh, help the facility identify those areas of deficiency. The USDA isn't necessarily going to hold your hand and walk you through everything in the facility or the regulations and tell the facility where it needs to be um, in compliance. It's just going to expect you to know that and to fix that. And this is typically when you would see um, council come in to assist in that. So we're continuing up the scale. We went from withholding the mark to now we're looking at suspension. And suspension, you're basically stopping the facility. You're, you're suspending all operations, all inspections will not occur. So even if you are going to continue with running production lines, there's not going to be inspectors there to uh, to inspect the meat and it's not going to go anywhere. So this is effect effectively shutting down all operations of the facility. And this is in 500.1c. And this typically follows the, the same issues we see here, 500.3a1 through 7. That was the same on the previous slide. We add an additional one here. We have um, subpart b, which is uh, talking about the inhumane uh, treatment of uh, animals. That's what Part B is about. And then both the withdrawal of the mark and the suspension can be imposed with no prior notification and they can be imposed with prior notification. So basically the USDA can say, you know what, we issued um, a notice that the, your HACCP plan was inadequate, we withheld the mark, uh, now we're giving notification that we're suspending inspections. And that would be a, a way to go for notification. It could be that suddenly something occurs in the facility, um, something like inhumane treatment of animals that's very sudden, and there's no prior notification, and suddenly you've, you've gone from no enforcement action to a very high level of inspection uh, enforcement action, and, and there's no notification there, and, and suddenly you're stuck and you need to, to fix something to have this happen. Now, suspensions are not going to typically be the call of the inspector there on the floor. They will definitely be a liaison communicating those issues to uh, their superior officers. And typically we see the suspension decision 
is made by a district manager or another high-level official. It's not going to be there in the facility, but those issues that are being identified by the inspector will be communicated, and if that r rises to the level that it needs to be a suspension, then the district manager will make that decision. So now we get to the ultimate enforcement power, the ultimate enforcement tool. We went from being able to slow down production lines, and now we're talking about withdrawing the inspection. And this is basically a total loss of inspectors. And as we said at the very beginning, if you don't have inspectors in the facility and you uh, fall under the mandatory continuous inspection, you're out of business. There's just no way that you can continue production. And so this is a very strong enforcement uh, power, and it's one that the USDA still exercises. It happens fairly frequently. And I, I went ahead and, uh, before recording this today, did a quick Google search to see when the last suspension occurred. And the last one was January 23rd of 2014. And I can include a link if anyone wants to email me. I will caution you that the notice of suspension includes some graphic details. So if you're a little squeamish, you may want to just read the first heading or uh, first page. The suspension in January 23rd was for the inhumane slaughter that was caught on undercover video. And so the notice of suspension is public, number one, so the facility isn't going to be able to change its name or, uh, you know, try and sell meat products under that name. It's going to be very public that this facility is not USDA inspected. And, you know, it can't open itself to litigation uh, because of that, and, and we can talk about that as well. So if you're interested in, in seeing what one of these notices looks like, I'm happy to share that, and if uh, there's enough of you that are interested, I'll just post it in the discussion board. But this um, this is a pretty serious step, and it, it takes a, some strong violations for this to occur, and not only a strong violation, but there's this extra language about not fit to engage in any business requiring inspection. It's, it's just saying you, you have, you just so lack an understanding of the regulations that no ability to correct those issues is enough to get you back into business. And so uh, th that's what's occurring here. And this is something that the USDA must administer very carefully. It's not something that can happen suddenly. It does have to go through a process, um, what's called an administrative hearing. And you may have heard this phrase, hearing, before. Um, if you watch Judge Judy, what Judge Judy does is a hearing. She has the plaintiffs um, and the defendants in front of her, and she's questioning, and she's gaining evidence. That's a hearing. When we talk about a judicial hearing, we're talking about a hearing that's in front of a judge, so the person that's in a black robe in a very nice courtroom, and that's a judicial hearing. When we're talking about an administrative hearing, we're talking about a hearing that is staying within the agency. So this would be a hearing that is between the USDA and there's what's called an administrative law judge. There would be a uh, USDA official or a USDA uh, judge that would hear the inspector side, typically through the district uh, manager or a superior officer, about what the basis was for the withdrawal or for the um, withdrawal of inspection or for if there was uh, prior issues that weren't being resolved, what those were. And then they would also hear if there was a story to tell from the facility itself. And so clearly this is one of the areas that the council is most definitely involved in uh, and, and typically trying the best they can to, to save a facility, but it, it's hard to do once it gets to this, to this phase. The USDA typically has very strong evidence of uh, the reason for withdrawal of inspection, and, and it can be challenging. And you can see why it'd be challenging, uh, you know, if in this example uh, I mentioned for the January 23rd, it was caught on undercover video, and the undercover video was clear enough that they could identify the facility. And the inspectors were able to testify and say that the, the facility in the video was the facility that they were very familiar with. So that kind of evidence can be really challenging to overcome. So hopefully you can see why these enforcement actions are so powerful. You can go every, everything from a minor disruption in the facility to shutting the facility down. And so 
these inspection powers, these enforcement powers are very powerful. And I, I think that's why it's important to look at the constraints that are placed on them, what rights a facility has to challenge them, what rights the facility has to make sure that they're being done appropriately, that they're not being done uh, for personal vendetta or uh, for personal gain out of any of, any of the inspectors. Very, very rare to see. But those sort of issues that you want to make sure that it's being done appropriately. And so what we'll do in the third lecture is we'll get into some of the constitutional limits and some of the case limits of what uh, has been seen in, in terms of both the USDA trying to expand its power and the uh, industry trying to either keep that power in check or in specific instances make sure that there are certain rights that they have during this process.